Mr. Ellison and Mr. McMahon are here to join me tonight for the uh, first of hopefully maybe many uh, debates between the candidates for the Libertarian National Committee uh, Secretary's Office uh, race. Uh, Mr. Ellison and Mr. McMahon are two of the candidates. The candidates were invited uh, to participate tonight. And Mr. McMahon and Mr. Ellison, I appreciate you both joining us. Uh, our debate format for tonight is going to be rather simple and focused on the candidates. The candidates will each have two minutes to offer an opening statement, followed by questions offered uh, to both candidates for, answer, for an answer. Both candidates will answer the same question uh, with the responding candidate having the opportunity to uh, answer anything that might have been offered by the first speaker. Following the, second, the first round of uh, direct questions, we'll have another alternating round of questions uh, between the candidates where they will have uh, one minute and 30 seconds to respond to it, and then their opponent will have an opportunity to rebut, and then hopefully a little back and forth at that point. Following the direct questions that will be offered by me, there will be questions offered uh, from the candidates to each other. Uh, the candidates will each have the opportunity to ask a question of their opponent. Their opponent will have the opportunity to answer, and then there will be no rebuttals. To conclude tonight's debate, the candidates will each have the opportunity to offer two minutes of a concluded, concluding statement. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Vincent Stoops and I'm hosting tonight's debate. I am the owner of the Downtown Media Company. I had hoped to join everyone in Austin and uh, given the world situation that we find ourselves in, this is uh, as close as I might find myself. So this is a, a, I really appreciate you guys joining me tonight. So uh, Mr. Ellison, uh, Mr. McMahon, thank you both for joining me. Thank you for setting this up. Very, very professionally set up on the front end, I have to say. Yeah, I Thank appreciate all the work you've put in, Mr. Stoops. Thank you both. Thank you both. So uh, to start tonight's debate, we'll, we'll work with alphabetical order, as that will give Mr. Ellison the opportunity to open tonight's conversation and Mr. McMahon the opportunity to close tonight's conversation. Uh, so Mr. Ellison, the floor is yours. Um, two minutes. Uh, whenever you would like to start. Yes, sir. So uh, once again, uh, Mr. Stoops, thank you very much for having me on, for setting this up. I'm very happy to be here and debate my uh, worthy opponent here, Mr. McMahon. And um, I, I've i been uh, up, up until, in fact, up until today, I was a uh, presidential candidate. And today I decided to drop out of the presidential race and really uh, turn my focus towards this race. I think the, the presidential race was fun. I had a lot of stuff. I, I made a lot of outreach, uh, talked to a lot of people. You know, I, I felt like I actually had some impact on that race. And hopefully it was positive. Uh, but this race is really much more important to me. This race is about, it's about the, about the internal workings of the party. Uh, anybody who's been paying attention certainly recently is, uh, should, should understand that the situation that we're in right now with the national party is really kind of a mess. There's probably a number of reasons for this. Um, I, I think that there is uh, some, some good intentions with most of the people on the LNC, but I think that there's also a whole lot of wishful thinking. And the wishful thinking has gotten us into a predicament right now where um, hopefully we can pull this convention off this weekend and we can get out of it. But in order to avoid this kind of stuff in the future, I think we really need to have some uh, very pragmatic thinking individuals, very business-minded people, people who can make decisions that are more about what is best for the party as a whole uh, versus what is uh, politically expedient or, or what serves somebody's faction. And so um, I really think that this election is gonna really be a referendum on, on that. We're gonna see uh, stark differences between some of the candidates who really are more focused about uh, helping the party grow and, and the betterment of the party versus some other candidates who are really focused uh, internally or on themselves and promoting themselves. And so. Um, I think that when it comes time to vote for this office, I really hope people consider the intentions of the uh, of the candidates, and I would really appreciate your support. Thank you so much, Mr. Ellison, Mr. McMahon. Uh, the same for yourself. Two minutes. All right. Well, 
thank you, Mr. Stoops, uh, for organizing this. I, I greatly appreciate it. Um, and for uh, you know, Mr. Ellison, it's always wonderful to be on the stage with you and have a good conversation, uh, debate the finer points, the things we may agree on and the things we don't agree on. Uh, and to everybody on Facebook who's watching, um, you know, I appreciate the questions that you've submitted and that you'll continue to submit as we move through this, this campaign. Um, for myself, I've been a party member for 10 years. Um, I've worked in campaigns since I was a small child growing up around uh, politics uh, with my aunt taking me to, to participate in candidate events. Um, worked in campaigns in the Libertarian Party in every state except Alaska and Hawaii. I've advised candidates, I've been party to petition drives, helped organize county parties, uh, did training sessions for county leaders and candidates and future campaign managers all across the country. Um, ballot access and candidate support are two of the things that are the most important to me. Uh, I hold them very dear. Uh, if you're a candidate, you might have reached out to me before in the past, and I've always been there to pick up the phone or answer a Facebook message to see what I could do to help your campaign. Um, watching the LNC over the past, uh, you know, two years, uh, it seems very divisive. Uh, it's very factionalized. Um, we have a group of people who um, have worked together in the past and have worked on several projects uh, and, and worked fine, but something has changed. And now it's an all or nothing uh, win at any cost. And it's, it's both sides of any argument. Uh, and I, I feel that that has damaged the party. It's turned people off. Uh, so my pledge is as a uh, secretary of the LNC, I will do the job, do it efficiently and do it without engaging in the tactics and vendettas that we see on display uh, right now. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. McMahon. I appreciate that. And Mr. Uh, uh, Ellison, uh, I appreciate your response as well. The candidness that you both are offering tonight. Uh, as we begin the first round of questions, we're going to start uh, with Mr. McMahon, uh, who will answer the first question with two minutes to respond. And then Mr. Ellison will have the same amount of time to respond to Mr. McMahon, as well as the question. So uh, for example, Mr. McMahon will be able to answer the question, uh, should we choose peanut butter or jelly? He will say we should choose peanut butter. Mr. Ellison will then have the opportunity to say, I either agree or disagree, but here's my position. They'll each have two minutes to respond. Uh, if they choose, they may exercise a 15 second rebuttal. Uh, if they don't, that's fine as well. Um, so to Mr. Uh, McMahon, our first question, uh, tonight comes from uh, Tom Arnold, uh, a well-known figure in the Libertarian Party. What is the most important aspect of the role of the Secretary of the Libertarian National Committee to you? The, the most important role is to be taking diligent uh, notes that are detailed uh, and delivered to the body and to the membership in a timely fashion. Uh, just looking right now, uh, there is a mail ballot that has uh, been going on for the past couple of days. Uh, and for those that aren't aware, um, the members of the LNC, if uh, enough people um, bring a motion together and sponsor a motion, it can be um, voted on via email during periods um, when they're in between meetings. Um, one was just recently done um, basically to rescind the previous motion uh, authorizing the online convention this, this coming weekend. Um, the mail ballot uh, voting has gone back and forth, but as of this morning, it hadn't been updated in three days on their official tally forms. For me, the role of secretary is making sure that that gets updated so that members and uh, members of the LNC know where their vote is, how it was recorded, or if it's been changed. And uh, membership knows how the representatives have voted. Uh, that's important, especially on a mail ballot where, where it's subject to change. So that's what I think is, is fundamental, is doing the job efficiently, correctly, and timely. And I yield the rest of my time. Thank you very much, Brian. Evan. Uh, Brian, the same to you, two minutes. Yeah, well, um... 
I, you know, I'd like to say, oh, I really disagree with everything. That, uh, uh, frankly, I disagree with, I, or I agree with everything he said. This is, uh, and this is something that it, that we just we haven't seen for, for at least the past few years. We need the secretary really needs to be focused on the the very specific responsibilities of the secretary, and, it, and it's outlined in the in the bylaws. It's about record keeping. It's about maintaining records. And like Evan said, I mean this this issue about the online voting. Um, it's been discussed for the last several days and people have questions. This is a very big issue. They're talking about canceling our convention a, the day before the convention and people are really on edge about what this vote is and the vote is simply not being updated. And so if people want updates, they have to actually go back through the email chain and look to, and, tr and try and figure it out. But this, that's, the, that's the role of the secretary. The role of the secretary is not to get involved in politicking. The role of the secretary is not to be the parliamentarian. The role of the secretary is to take take efficient records and deliver the records in a very timely manner. Uh, it's something that I've I've been doing in my uh, career in construction for years, and it's something I'm I'm certainly more than qualified for. So it's it's a very simple job, but it does take a lot of work. There, there's a lot of work that goes into it. It's a very big time commitment, but uh, it certainly isn't difficult. But it, it seems like it's very easy at this point to get sidetracked. And I would tell uh, the delegates that. Um, uh, I will not get sidetracked. This is it's it's too important of a job to put it on the back burner for uh, and make other priorities. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, Mr. McMahon, if you'd like to, you could offer rebuttal, um, but your position seemed to be pretty much in agreement. Yep, we'll save that 15 seconds for later. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds great. Okay, so moving on to the next one, Mr. Ellison, now you'll have the opportunity to answer first. Uh, the question being the, that, that you already started to answer, the role of the LNC chair takes quite a bit of time. Uh, it takes quite a bit of uh, personal investment. How do you plan to accommodate that personal and time investment uh, in order to successfully carry out the role? Well, so the role of the LNC secretary, I, I would I would estimate that depending on what's going on, you're looking at probably an average of 10 to 20 hours a week uh, that you need to be able to put in to keep on top of things. And and I would I would also venture to guess that when you come up to events like uh, planning for convention and things like this, there's probably more time commitment, and there's probably times where there's less of a time commitment. Um, I have been investing so much of my my spare time at this point already in Libertarian Party activities that rolling into something, rolling into taking care of these responsibilities of the LNC secretary would would essentially be it would be no big deal. I spend these hours do, doing Libertarian Party work already. Uh, now I'm I guess I, I don't want to misrepresent that. I'm not necessarily doing party work, uh, but I'm doing work on behalf of of the cause of liberty liberty for sure. I've, whether it's a campaign or whether it's activism of some sort. And so um, I am really looking to uh, redirect some of that energy. Um, I, for anybody who's somewhat familiar with my background, my activism has gotten me in like a little bit of trouble, a little bit. Uh, and um, so, you know, I, I think that focusing on this uh, internal party politics, you know, uh, running the business of the party would be a much better use of my time at this point. And uh, again, I understand the time commitment and I'm fully capable and, and certainly looking forward. Uh, to investing that time and helping to uh, helping to make the LNC run more efficiently, get the records uh, turned around quicker, and stay on top of things, keep the members informed. Thank you so much, Mr. McMahon. The floor is yours. Uh, it's easy for somebody to say that they are capable of, um, you know, setting aside the time requirements, and I can make you all of the assurances in the world that I can make those those time allowances. Uh, I've done it in my businesses. Uh, I've done it in my philanthropy. I've done it for the Libertarian Party of Indiana uh, as the development director. I've done it for campaigns. Um, but you're taking it on our trust. Um, and one of the things that, that I have uh, that can indicate that is I have the ability to say no. And um, I will turn things down. I will turn down committee assignments if um, I feel like it's not a proper use of my time. Um, I have turned down campaigns and candidates before. Uh, there are a handful of presidential campaigns that were told, no, um, my priority is, is the party um, and, and doing these types of jobs. Um, when it comes to my personal life, um, 
you know, which was something that that somebody else uh, had mentioned on Facebook that our, our uh, partners and our family may not uh, be happy that we're committing these things. Well, I can tell you about three months after my, my boyfriend relocated from Flint, Michigan to move in with me in Indianapolis, um, I was asked to relocate to Phoenix, Arizona to run Nick Sarwark's mayoral campaign. And I said, welcome to Indianapolis, honey. Uh, I'll see you in a year. Um, and it was a year. And we talked on Facebook and uh, we actually talked on Zoom. Uh, yes, Zoom did exist before COVID-19. Um, and, you know, he's accepted that. He knows that uh, my role as an independent film producer and as an FDA consultant, there are times where I may be home, but you don't get to see me for a week because I'm busy working. There are times that I'm going to be on the road for a film production. There are times that I'm going to be assisting a candidate. There are times when I'm going to be working on party business. One of the things that I think is lacking is we do not utilize our staff to help us maintain some of these records. And I think that that's something that as secretary I'll be exploring, which is to have staff assist in maintaining these records uh, and, you, and helping Mayor. to fill that role. Thank you very much for, for that. Uh, if, so now moving on, Mr. If I could just follow the up. opportunity to respond if, first. If I could sure, just go ahead. Yeah, if I could just follow up on something that uh, that Evan brought up, he mentioned the committee assignments, and that's one thing that um, we really need to get that out to members more than we have more than just having the LNC take it on themselves. And so I so I, I support that idea 110 percent. We should not, uh, as the secretary, I would not be looking to involve myself in every committee. I would be looking to handle the business that the delegates elect me to handle, and that would be the role of the secretary. Any other committees? Time permitting, I'm not saying that I'm gonna avoid committees, but certainly I, the priority definitely needs to be the, the role of the secretary. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Allison. I, I do appreciate that. I did let you go over a little bit extra there just because I do think you guys are both having a good conversation. I think this one, this is a point that we could definitely explore a little bit uh, with the committee assignments. Uh, Mr. McMahon, I wanted to bring the question, next question back to you, uh, which, comes back onto those along those lines where you're going to have to bring people back into the folds. Uh, the recent activity at the LNC has been a little bit contentious across the whole party has been contentious. One of the jobs of all of the officers on the LNC is going to be to rebuild bridges. How do you plan to begin the process of rebuilding bridges so the LNC can get back to work as quickly as possible? Well, I think the, the first thing is you have to understand what the problem was. Why did people leave? And I think that when we see people um, not renewing their membership, we should do what other organizations do, which is send them a survey. Um, have somebody reach out to them, have somebody call them um, and say, why? You know, wh what happened? Why, why did you leave? How can we make the organization better? Um, there are a lot of organizations that do that when they see people leave, when they see people cancel their membership or stop their donations. You gotta find out why. Is it because times are tough or is it because they're really angry about something that you did? Um, without that kind of information, all you're doing is uh, basing your actions off of the, the loudest voice on Facebook or Twitter. And that may not necessarily be representative of what the issue as a whole is. So first of all, I think that's an issue that we need to, uh, something that we need to inst instill in our organization, which is reaching out to people to find out where they're at with their feelings about how the LNC is operating. The next thing is, is I'm the development director for the Libertarian Party of Indiana. Part of my job is to reach out to membership. Um, part of my job is to grow membership. So I find like-minded organizations and, and try to get new members. Um, and then the other part of that job is to uh, squeeze as much money out of their pockets as I possibly can um, once they become a member. So that's what I would bring to the table as, as uh, secretary. But even if I'm not secretary, it's something that I bring to the table, which is that understanding that we need to, to build those bridges by one, acting like professionals in the room and not like petulant children. Uh, we need to reach out and find out why people are leaving, uh, get their input, get their feedback, and then two, welcome them back, actually ask them to come back in a proper way. Uh, that's how I would handle it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Allison. 
Yeah. So, so I guess I maybe interpreted the question a little bit differently because I'm looking at, at it more as like post post election of the LNC. How are we going to pull people together after everybody's been splintered based on recent history? And I think that, uh, and so I don't know if that's the intent of the question. That's how I took it. That's how I'm going to answer it. So I think that, uh, the main focus needs to be we need to be electing representatives who understand that that's exactly what they are as representatives. We need to elect people who understand that it's their job to represent the delegates and not represent themselves. We need to we need to elect people who understand that they're not party leaders. This is not party leadership. This party's the leaders of this parties are the uh, this party are the boots on the ground. And so how do we build this, build the uh, the unity back and, and rebuild these bridges? It's we, we need to establish trust. A new board, a new LNC needs to establish trust with the members. And, the, and we need to do that as soon as possible. I think one of the biggest things we can do in order to get this, this unity back and build these bridges is to have this election for LNC officers as soon as possible. This, this, these elections should be happening this weekend. Now, I don't know what the delegates are gonna do, but I think that that would go a long way. Here, we're gonna have a presidential camp candidate and we're gonna have people wanting to rally behind a presidential candidate, yet we're still gonna have this contention from this dysfunctional LNC. And I think that's really problematic. And so I think that the best way to resolve that and build these bridges, like I said, get this election out of the way. Get the LNC elected, get the new board seated and move forward in the future together and make sure that we get the right people on, on that understand their role in running the business of the of the party and not pushing their personal agendas. Thank you very much, Mr. Allison. Um, so leading into the last question uh, before moving on to the next uh, phase of the debate, uh, this question again is for both of you. Uh, Mr. Ellison, you'll answer first to th for this one. Um, and for those people who are watching who are not Libertarian Party insiders, recently the question of what a place is has become significant. Uh, specifically, the bylaws say that a place uh, needs to be named. Um, so the question for you both would be, beginning with Mr. Ellison, is, is the internet a place? And you can answer that however you want that just like you did before is totally fine. All right, so um, yeah, short answer, is the internet a place? Of course the internet's a place. So, I mean, I, I think it's it's just a ridiculous assertion to pretend that it's not a place. In fact, we had one of my good friends put forth a motion in front of the Libertarian uh, Executive Council of the State of Michigan this weekend uh, that wherefore the LNC says that the internet is not a place, okay, boomer. And it's like, I mean, I, I think that about sums it up. Of course, the internet's a place. The reality is, is that discussion about the internet being a place had nothing to do with whether or not anybody thought the internet was a place, right? This was about pushing an agenda, just like it always was. Some of the people, and specifically, one of the people that fought about this, the internet not being a place and this being some huge violation of our bylaws, and we need to stick to the letters of our bylaws, or we can't, uh, or, or, the secretary is gonna to refuse to sign the certificates of nomination and hold the party hostage, which is ridiculous in and of itself. But, but that same person who said that, who threatened to hold the party hostage over this, two years ago when we didn't elect a, a judicial committee, she said, well, we need to stick with the spirit of the bylaws and we need to send out a ballot by mail. Like, yeah, the spirit of the bylaws matter. And the spirit of the bylaws say that the, the LNC is responsible for, for for allowing for the business of the party to move forward. And instead of that happening, the LNC tried to prohibit the business of the party from moving forward. The, the specific verbiage within the bylaws is less important than the spirit behind the bylaws. And the spirit was that there needed to be a convention that took place. And when it's not possible to meet in, meet in person, the internet is a place we can meet. I yield the balance of my time. <laughs> I, well, his, his microphone's muted. I right. think Thank you very so much, Mr. Ellison. Mr. McMahon, the uh, same question for you. Is the internet a place? So, so I have my own personal opinion on whether or not the internet is a place when it comes to governing documents like these. Um, now, before I tell you what my personal preference is or my personal belief, um, I think the more important question is, 
does my opinion matter? Um, and I don't believe my opinion or anybody else on the LNC's opinion matters. I think the only opinion that matters is the membership and the delegates. They're ultimately the ones that will decide whether or not place can, uh, and the internet can be in a place. Um, they're the ones who will decide whether or not they agree with the LNC deciding that uh, the agenda is going to be fixed and only cover the, the POTUS and VPOTUS uh, um, nominations. They're the ones that will decide whether or not to even gavel in this convention. They may close the entire thing down and say, no, we're going to have an in-person meeting in July. And that is their right and responsibility to do. Um, but the thing that really strikes me about this is the culture that exists around this. And it's this. This dastardly thing right here is neither a weapon nor a sacred text. It is a guide. It is not a governing document. It is a guide. And this Robert's Rules of Order and our bylaws serve our members, not the other way around. What our members say and what our delegates say, that's what goes. And so that's, my personal preference doesn't matter. Ultimately, it's the role and responsibility of the delegates to say whether or not they believe the LNC was accurate or inaccurate in that position. Now, I think we need to be considering um, at our future conventions, the impact that this debate has had, that our bylaws have not been updated, that we use a parliamentarian system that is tech phobic, um, that we have for a long time been dismissive of health concerns and financial concerns of people needing to uh, participate remotely. And it took a national disaster or crisis uh, for that to come to a head. While every other organization in the country is, is moving forward, we're looking to the I past. To update, Ms. McMahon. I do appreciate, do appreciate the in-depth response, and I think we'll get into it again uh, coming up here in some of the next coming questions. Um, I appreciate you both your responses there in that portion of the debate here moving forward. Uh, you'll each be presented with your own question. Uh, the candidate being asked will have a minute and a half, one minute and 30 seconds to respond. Their opponent will then have uh, 30 seconds to rebut any or respond to anything that they might have to offer there. Uh, the point of this is more to get into some discussion. Uh, so if it goes on from there, that would be great. You'd each have the option to employ some rebuttals and we'll just let it go and, and be a little bit fluid with it. Unless it gets out of hand, we'll get it back. But things seem to be going pretty nicely. I appreciate both of your, your active cooperation. So moving forward, Mr. Ellison, you'd be asked the first question in this portion. Uh, the question would be, is a big tent worth it? The Libertarian Party has a big debate over whether or not the big tent philosophy is worth the trouble that it brings in or if it's uh, uh, worth it, you know, just generally, is it worth it? So the question to you is, is a big tent worth it? So I think that um, maybe maybe we need to define how big this tent is, right? Because if the tent's too big, then we're we're uh, inviting in uh, anybody and everybody, and certainly not anybody and everybody uh, can un understands or is willing to accept our our fundamental principles. I think that rather than thinking of it as a big tent, I think we need to think of it as a big door, a huge door, right? Uh, anybody who looks at, at us, looks at the platform, looks at the party, looks at a candidate, says, wow, that's something I'm really interested in. Come take a look. Come on, take a look, see if it's something that, that you're interested in. Now, I think that when we bring people in, it's important that we are always functioning at, on, on our principles. We're always representing our principles. It's important that we don't misrepresent those principles because I think that brings the wrong people in the door who, who aren't uh, looking to assimilate. And so I think that we need to bring people in. But if we if we fundamentally act in principle in a principled manner, and we follow those principles, and we we behave in in a way that that, that we advocate for, um, then I think that the people that belong in this organization, the Libertarian Party, will stick around because it'll resonate with them. And the people who don't want to be here, they'll leave. And so we've seen where um, you know some people were talking about coming up with some barrier to entry. And I know there was some 
a big, huge discussion about it because somebody who had been convicted of some sex crime and was in prison applied to be a member and we should stop his membership. And no, we should take his money, right? Okay, he paid the money. He, he presumably made the pledge, wanted to join the party and let him be, let him become, in, let him join the party. If he doesn't fit Thank in, you. he'll Thank leave. Thank you so much, Mr. Ellis. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Allison. Mr. McMahon, if you wanted to, you would have uh, 30 seconds to offer anything in addition or in rebuttal. Yeah, I think we finally found the thing that me and uh, Mr. Ellison disagree with. Um, I am a big tent guy. And my thing is, is that if I can work with you on just one issue to advance the cause of liberty, I want you in my camp. I want us working together. We can fight about all the other things later. But if I can bring you in on that one issue, and then I can get you to listen to people like Dr. Michael Munger or some of our other uh, philosophical libertarians, slowly you're going to drink the libertarian Kool-Aid and you're going to change. When I came into the party, I was nowhere near 100, 100 libertarian. I was, I was pretty statist. Um, and I grew to become a libertarian. I want that big tent. I want people to grow and be able to do that. Thank you very much, Mr. McMahon. Uh, Brian, if you wanted to respond, we could we could keep moving forward with this one if this is something that you guys disagreed yeah, on. Yeah, 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 let's keep moving with this one. I got more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so I just I think that there's a concern about the tent being too big, and I think that I draw a distinction between whether or not I'm willing to work with somebody or whether or not I would invite them into uh, into the party and welcome them into the party. So you know, I think that you know. My, my neighbors and I can work together on projects that seem to make sense for both of us, but I'm not going to invite them to sleep in my bedroom. And so I think that that's probably the difference. We, we can work across party lines with a lot of people. We can work uh, with independence on a lot of issues. Uh, but, but really, our, the, the goal of the party, it's as outlined in the platform, we need to stick to that. And if, pe if somebody comes in and they're, you know, they're close on the platform, but they're off on a couple of things. Again, I'm not advocating for a purity test or kicking people out. I'm just advocating that we don't misrepresent who we are to trick people to join our party so that they can come in and try and change it. And I think that was a big threat that, uh, that Justin Amash brought to the party is he was misrepresenting some very basic fundamental principles of libertarianism. And, and there was a threat that he was going to bring a lot of people in here in that followed the, those same principles and, and uh, it could really change the dynamic of our party for the worse. All right. Mr. McMahon, if you want to take about a minute to, to respond, yeah. that would be... So I think anybody who, who wants to say that they're a libertarian, that wants to be a libertarian as a party member, that wants to join our party and wants to be part of our organization, if you look at our platform and you find the things that you agree with and you say, that's me on any level, even if it's just one item, I am not the arbiter that's going to say, no, you're not, go home. Come back when you've read more uh, Hayek or Locke or you know the road to, free, uh, road to serfdom. Um, instead, I'm going to say, come on in. Let's be friends. Let's, let's fight this uh, you know, omnipotent state together. And as we're moving down the, the train of liberty, you're going to become more of a libertarian. Now, that doesn't mean that that person has to become our standard bearer. Um, that doesn't mean that that person becomes our chairman. That doesn't mean that that person becomes a presidential or vice presidential uh, candidate. All it means is that we have welcomed them and said, please come be with us in this room, not just stand over there in your corner and, and we'll, we'll work together on these issues. It's you think you're a libertarian. I'm not going to tell you you're not. It's just the same way that when somebody says to me that they're a Christian, I do not go. But are you really? Yes. Let me tell you why you're not a Christian. Instead, right. I say, OK. That's you. And I, I think, think we need to be I more I think we can see the, the differences unless you guys want. I guess I, I would just have I one very quick question, question and I'd pose to, to Evan. Do Before, you think that racists belong in the Libertarian Before. Party? Oh, I believe so no. I'm going to pause that. Oh, I'm going to pause this just for a second because we do have a time. We do have a time. We do have a place for the for you guys to ask each other direct questions here coming up, uh, and we can we can definitely let that one play out a little bit if you guys would like. Uh, just keep moving forward. Uh, okay, we'll put so, a pin in that. Um, and Mr. Ask Ellis, me in a minute, okay? 
No, oh, I, I believe we'll definitely come back to that. No <laughs> worries. No worries. So, Mr. Ellison, thank you for that. You opened up that first one. Uh, now, Mr. McMahon, uh, can the Libertarian Party maintain 50 state ballot access? Uh, can it? Absolutely. Um, I think one of the strengths of our party is our membership and our activists and our local candidates. Um, by supporting them and supporting the affiliates and giving them the resources and training that they need and, and the freedom to move and operate, um, they're the ones who ultimately raise the, the, uh, the notoriety of uh, the Libertarian Party locally in their, in their own state. Um, that gives the presidential candidate um, more footing in those, in those affiliates. But that's what it takes. We cannot continue as a party to uh, sue our way onto ballots uh, for the next 40 years. We've done that and you know we've gotten there. The next step is we need to provide the resources to the candidates and the affiliates for them to maintain that access. Now we should be filing lawsuits against egregious uh, ballot access uh, restrictions. Here in Indiana, we have a 2% uh, Secretary of State requirement. You get that and you've got automatic ballot access. In Indiana, we've had ballot access since 1994 um, because we, we put a lot of effort into that Secretary of State race every four years. Um, and a lot of states struggle with it and we need to do more to help them uh, overcome those hurdles. But yes, absolutely 100% we can, we can retain 50 state ballot access. And if we lose 50 state ballot access, um, it's a blemish and we should be ashamed as a national party. Thank you very much, Mr. McMahon. Mr. Ellison, if you had a response. Yeah, I would, I would really probably just echo a lot of what Evan said. Um, I, I think that it is important, important to point, point out that the fundamental responsibility of establishing or maintaining that ballot access is on the states themselves. And the national party can certainly come in and, and assist those states that need help. There's some states that have uh, a lot a lot uh, taller hill to climb than others. And so there, there is a cert, certainly a, an important role for the national party to step in and help those states. But really, ultimately, it's the boots on the ground. It's the, it's the workers. It's the, it's the activists within each ind independent state that is going to uh, ensure that we maintain that ballot access. And like you said, I think it's certainly possible. It's just how much work are we willing to put in? And history says that our activists are willing to put in the work. Thank you so much, Mr. Ellison. Uh, the next I'd like to take a, because I get that quick response. Go for it. I want to add it. one other thing. Um, in 2014, when I was at the Libertarian National Campaign Committee, um, the Libertarian Party of Illinois had uh, been challenged on their petition signatures. And we've never survived that petition challenge before. So I went from Indiana to Illinois and I spent a month in Springfield, Illinois at a hotel, helping them uh, train their volunteers, train their team, and then going into the election office every day to defend their petitions. And it was the first time that they had ever been successful uh, in beating back a challenge. And all of their statewide candidates were on the ballot that year. That was not something that was going to be achievable just by the state affiliate. Um, they needed guidance, they needed help, they needed somebody else to come out. Um, now, I'm not the, the savior or anything like that. It was just one other guy who's gone through it before. Um, we need to have more of those resources going into affiliates so it's not just on them. We need to be, be assisting with those types of challenges to protect our ballot access because it is Thank you for fundamental. That. Thank you for that addition, Mr. Ellison, if you, had, if you wanted to offer a, a brief response? No, I certainly agree. And, and Evan is one of the examples of those uh, activists on the ground that actually get stuff done. And, and uh, certainly the National Party needs to step up when, when a, an affiliate is working their asses off to get something done and they're just up against the wall. Absolutely. Appreciate, appreciate that guys very much. Uh, so now back to you, Mr. Ellison, uh, to, for this question. Mr. McMahon uh, briefly touched on it. Uh, so is Robert's rules of order a useful tool or a skill necessary to participate in the LNC? Is it something that that should be used as a, a way to get ahead or is it something that's just there? 
Okay, so you're so I'm glad you clarified because you said a way to get ahead. It it kind of gets to the root of what you're really asking. So uh, it's because because fundamentally it's both a, a a guide and a useful tool. The problem is when it's a tool that's abused. It is not a tool to be abused. It is not a tool to be used in order to circumvent the process or. I, Anybody who spends more time within a meeting citing parliamentary inquiries or points of order or clear, they're being counterproductive to the goals of the party. It's not the responsibility of every member on the LNC to understand and be able to, to cite Robert's rules backward and forward. I think you need to have a rudimentary understanding of the process, and I think most of them do. Um, but it is not intended to be a tool to hold other members of the committee hostage like it's been used lately. It is simply a guide. It's meant to establish rules of order that allow the organization to function, not prohibit it from functioning. Thank you, Mr. Ellison. Mr. McMahon, if you- uh, like, I, like I said before, um, Robert's rules or any parliamentary system is not a sacred text or a weapon. It is a guide used to help you foster. The actual purpose of Robert's is to facilitate debate so that there is an equal voice for everybody to, so that discussion can happen and an idea can be fully formed. That was the whole purpose of Robert's. Uh, but instead, it's used as a way to trip people up and to force votes and to backtrack and force an agenda. Um, there are several organizations that I'm part of, and not one of them uses the phrase governing document. If we have a parliamentary system in there, it is a guidance, not a governing document. And in some of them, we don't have a parliamentary uh, uh, system like this because we trust each other. Now, I know that's hard for us to do, uh, even though where a lot of us are anarchists, uh, we tend to really, really like having uh, a lot of complex rules about what we can do. So, so we're going to keep moving ahead and we'll actually uh, only ask a few more questions for this portion before we get into the opportunity for you guys to ask each other some direct questions. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your evening. I do appreciate you both taking part in tonight's debate very much. I know uh, some people are very busy, so I appreciate you taking the time out of your evening. Uh, back to you, Mr. McMahon, and I expect this one to spark some conversation here. How does the departure hmm. of Justin Amash change the Libertarian Party nomination? Hmm. So that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I know that there were a lot of people who were looking forward um, to Justin Amash. Um, they wanted to see him on the debate stage for the Libertarian Party, and a lot of people see him as a potential standard bearer. Um, what I see right now is, you know, that's gone. I'm glad that he, he came. I'm glad that he switched his designation to Libertarian and that we have an official Libertarian in Congress. Uh, I do agree with uh, Mr. Ellison that I'd like to see his, his position change on immigration, the border wall, and uh, potentially uh, abortion rights. Um, that being said, uh, the way he exited his campaign, uh, he used we statements instead of you statements. So when he was talking about fundamental changes in the party, he said, we must do this, not you must do this. Um, so I, I think he's going to be sticking around for a while. I hope he is. Um, I hope he's not doing kind of what somebody else did in, in 2016. I think he's going to stick around. Um, that's my hope. I hope he becomes more like us. Uh, I'd love to see him get reelected to his congressional seat. But right now we have a lot of great activists uh, and historical members in our party who have been dedicated to the advancing of liberty and freedom for 20 to 40 years who are running for president and vice president. Um, I don't see this as being soul crushing or uh, an end to our party. I think we've got some great people uh, who can be standard bearers for the party right now. Thank you very much, Evan. Uh, Brian, if you wanted to offer anything. Yeah, I mean, really, I agree with most of what Evan said. Uh, you know, I was, it, it felt like a real uh, threat when Justin Amash joined the party and said he was going to run for president and all these people uh, were backing him and he was became in the press our presumptive nominee and I think that that it was, it's a dangerous it's dangerous anytime we allow an outsider in to come in uh, new who would never really uh, um, read, even read our platform and say okay here take the reins I mean we've done that a few times and, and 
Uh, I just didn't don't think it's turned out as well as it, it otherwise could have. And so um, I'm I'm ultimately I'm glad he joined the party. I'm glad he stayed in the party. Like Evan said, his, the way he exited the race was very professional. And I, I hope he gets elected. I'd be happy to help work on his campaign. I hope he endorses other candidates. I think that having him in the party is a true asset. However, I do think that him being our standard bearer and representing us on the presidential ticket would have been a big mistake. Thank you so much, both of you, for your responses for that question. Uh, Mr. Ellison, back to you. Uh, and I think this was a question you both wanted to touch on a little bit earlier. Um, how can the Libertarian Party best utilize the human resources and social capital that it already has? Human resources and social capital. Um, I think that we, we as representatives need to set an example for the, uh, for the activists. Our, our, our resources are our activists. Our resources are the boots on the ground. Th these people are, I mean, most of them don't need a whole lot of uh, motivation, but what they don't need is, is dysfunction. And, and the way that we can motivate them and maximize the return on, on what their time investment is, is by being there to, to efficiently run the party, to stay out of the way and to assist where we can assist. We're, we're not, this, this organization is not a top-down organization. We are not directing people. We're facilitating and we're helping them to facilitate. And so I think that the best way that we can maximize the return on any of that is again, is, to, is for the LNC to efficiently handle the business of the party and allow activists, allow candidates to, to do what they need to do in order to spread the message of liberty. Spreading the message of liberty is not the function of the LNC. It's the function of party members and it's the function of candidates. We just need to be there to help facilitate that and to get out of the way when we need to get out of the way. Thank you so much, Mr. McMahon, if you had anything to offer. Yeah, I want to, I want to give it an actual specific to it. Um, so when you contact the party, um, either your state or the national party, and you say, I'd like to be involved, you get either a join, or if you did join, here's your state chair and here's your county chair. And that's it. And then maybe you get a follow up that says, hey, go volunteer for this campaign. So, you know, and my state chair is probably going to be real mad that I let this out of the bag. But, you know, in Indiana, we're developing a program where we don't just say, you know, hey, go work on a campaign, go volunteer there. Instead, we say, here's something, pick what you would like to be trained on doing. Here's the list. What would you like to do? What are your skill sets? And we're going to ask you to do these things regularly. And I don't just mean like every six months. I mean, like once a week, we want you to sit down and we want you to call people. We want you to uh, send postcards to people. We want you to do something. And I think that that's where we lose that um, social capital. That's where we lose that human power is that we're not asking people to do things other than to go on Facebook and, and talk about it. Mr. Instead, I think we should, we should be asking people to actually do I, things and helping the state set that system up. I appreciate the response. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ellison, if you wanted to offer anything further on that. No, I think that it sounds like Evan has some well thought out plans and uh, I'd be anxious to talk with him offline and, you know, when I'm elected secretary, hopefully we can implement some of that stuff. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds great. Uh, so now, Mr. McMahon, back to you for the, the final question of this round. Um, uh, maybe a little bit more uh, uh, philosophical or, or hopeful. Uh, what state will turn gold first? Indiana. I don't need the full minute or minute and a half. It'll be Indiana. For a we're, the, we're the hardest working affiliate uh, in the country. Uh, we have 11 elected libertarians right now in Indiana. We have multiple, uh, I, think, I think seven libertarians appointed to boards and commissions in Indiana. The only thing that's holding us back is um, uh, straight ticket voting. Uh, and, and we actually feel pretty confident that when Republicans around the state and, and pretty uh, well uh, established Republican spots got their butts kicked by Democrat straight ticket voting, they're now in a position where they actually want to see it go away statewide. Um, so that's going to be uh, when, in, when we have a state that turns, turns gold. And I, I, I think it's going to be Indiana. And I'm not just biased because it's where I'm from and I've got the 
seal tattooed on my arm. Um, we're a pragmatic state. Um, we're even even our radicals uh, who are very radical. We work well together. Uh, and that's what it takes. It takes all the different flavors of libertarianism coming together, whether you're a big L or a little L, whether you're a longstanding party member, whether you hate national, it doesn't matter. We all come together and we support our candidates here and we cultivate um, that culture of respect. The board that I serve on on the state party, um, we disagree and we may have screaming matches at each other over things, but at the end of the day, when the meeting is over, we are respectful to each other. We are friends and we know that we're on the same team trying to fight for the same thing, which is liberty in our time. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be Indiana, mark my words. And if you're not from Indiana and you disagree, uh, Brian Ellison told me to say that. <laughs> well, and, and uh, Mr. Ellison to you, what state will turn gold first? That that's a great question. And uh, in all honesty, it's not something I've spent a lot of time pondering. I have been pretty impressed by uh, the election results that we've seen in, in lower tier races in Pennsylvania. I know they were making a big wave. They were making a lot of moves. Perhaps there's some disruptive elements right now, but I, I think they got their last convention. They got some stuff back in, in line. And uh, I think that they were making tremendous progress. Uh, they may have the numbers that uh, of elected officers that are elected officials that outnumber Indiana, but I don't know. I don't have the details, but it, I remember being pretty impressed by the, the returns. Uh, aside from that, I'll take Evan's word. Um, I, I think Evan's a fairly trustworthy guy. Maybe I've heard that in circles. Uh, and if he says that uh, he's confident that it, it maybe it will be Indiana, I'm not sure. Uh, so, I encourage him to keep doing more of what he's doing. Sounds good. Uh, as a rebuttal. Um, uh, Pennsylvania actually did amazing, and um, I, I, I'm not. There's some way that Indiana outnumbers them, but I can't remember what it is. Uh, but Pennsylvania actually knocked it out of the park. The other thing is the Frontier Project that's uh, being headed by Apollo. Um, that project, working with uh, candidates in the Western states, um, they're they're going to have state legislators um, this cycle that are going to get elected. I'm actually very confident in that. I think Wyoming will be that state. Um, so as much as I love my home state of Indiana, I, I think that we're gonna see some state legislators uh, out in uh, the Western states as part of that frontier project. It's a great project. And if you can get involved in volunteer, I highly recommend you doing it. Um, Apollo is doing an amazing job out there. They, they actually won a state legislative seat that got taken away because of a box of rediscovered absentee ballots. Oh, wow, okay. All right, fantastic. Well, um, that would be the the last question that I would like to ask for you, from you, gentlemen, uh, which brings us into your opportunity to question each other. Um, if you've had any uh, points of disagreement that have popped up tonight or any previous questions, please feel free to ask them. Uh, just remember the, uh, the zuckening will get us all if we, I'm sure they'll track us down. So we're live. But Mr. McMahon, the floor is yours. Oh, I get to go first? You oh, get to okay. ask your question first. Uh, I'd ask that you keep your question to under 15 seconds, if you would. And then, Mr. Ellison, you will have two minutes to respond to that question. Mr. McMahon, you will not have the opportunity to offer any rebuttals. So Mr. Ellison's response will stand as is. Fair enough. Uh, Mr. Ellison, uh, I just wanted to know, um, are you familiar with this uh, game? And uh, if so, how can other people get it? And why should they? Because I'm a nice guy. That's my question to you. Uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. So what that is, is that was, uh, that's Thin Blue Line, the game. And what that is, is that was my team and I, I hate to call it my team but when I was running for house it was it was our team it was a, a group of us got together and it was uh, our response to me receiving a restraining order from uh, every police department in the world that a lot uh, would, would prohibit me from being within 50 feet of any law enforcement officer and so in response we put together this amazing game it's a one-of-a-kind law enforcement simulation card game. Uh, Evan can testify to how, well, he's not allowed to because he can't respond. But if he could, he would tell you how fun it is to play. 
uh, and, and actually how humorous it is. The best part about that game, though, is not just when you play with uh, your like-minded friends, but bring it out in front of your family and your, your normie friends. They'll love it. So uh, thank you for the plug, Evan. It's fantastic. Uh, ThinBlueLineGame.com. So, uh, okay, we're going to roll with that. Uh, Mr. Ellison, the, uh, the uh, same opportunity would go to you. Hopefully it's uh, as charitable, maybe. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I, I mean, I wish I would have planned ahead. Do we only get one question? No, you, we, uh, we planned for an hour, so I actually cut the previous section a little bit short so that okay. we could fit the opportunity for you both to ask each other two questions, uh, followed by your closing statements tonight. Okay, so my first question then for you, Mr. McMahon, uh, I kind of alluded to it. I actually asked it earlier, but let me frame it a little bit better for you. So you mentioned that you want a big tent. Mm -hmm. I think the danger of uh, having a big tent is that the, some of the undesirables that can be attracted to that big tent. I see a large threat of uh, racist people, uh, uh, alt-right, um, mm -hmm. Nazi adjacent uh, coming into the party. And I think that's a problem for the party. Uh, how do you feel about that? Um, I believe that no quarter uh, should be given to um, Nazis, racists, homophobes, bigots. Um, you know, just it's repugnant to the ideas of liberty. But I believe that you as an individual have the right to, to make that decision for yourself. If you don't want to associate with people, that's perfectly fine. As far as the party should be concerned, again, I don't think we have that litmus test. I don't think we have that. But what we do is, I don't want to sit with you. If you're a racist or you're a homophobe or you're a bigot, I don't want to sit with you. I'm a gay man. Um, I mentioned my boyfriend earlier. And this is a conversation that we have quite often. Um, you know, he was one of those, oh, punch a Nazi in the face. And I'm like, no, that's not okay. Be mad at them. Tell them what a vile piece of excrement you think they are. Protest them. Um, vote them down. But, you know, I'm not going to go around and check people for Nazi tattoos. Uh, I'm not going to troll through their, their, uh, their history to find out if, if they used to be a Klan member. If they say something repugnant, I'm going to tell them, I think that's repugnant. And then I'm going to turn my back on them and walk away. What we do is we make it uncomfortable for people to stay. And we make sure when they try to run for a position, like on the you know, judicial committee or at large or chair or for their state chair or anything like that, we make sure that we say, yeah, your behavior, your tone, your rhetoric is kind of repugnant. Um, we're not gonna kick you out of the party, but we're not gonna give you the keys either. That's, that's my philosophy. And I think we're adult enough and grown up enough and respectful enough to be able to do that without it devolving into, you know, feces throwing spectacle. Thank you very much, Mr. McMahon. I appreciate uh, both of your responses there for the first set of questions, Mr. McMahon, then if you had your second, uh, but this would be your final direct question for Mr. Ellison. Um, I think my, my final question would be, would be this. Um, the current secretary who would be the chair or the, the uh, convention secretary um, has stated she would not sign documents that she thought would perjure herself. And then she said that um, she was later told by Richard, Ring Richard Winger uh, and our attorney that everything was fine. And they took her at her word on that. Come to find out that the party actually signs like 56 of these statements of uh, candidacy um, that gets sent out. I don't know if she will sign that prior to the, the ratification convention in July. If she says she wouldn't do that, would you step forward today and volunteer as uh, convention secretary uh, and ultimately sign that document, those documents prior to ratification and securing ballot access in several states like Wisconsin, Delaware, um, New Listen, Hampshire, Georgia. Your response? Yes, <clears throat> absolutely. Uh, I think that uh, regard, 
I think that there's more at issue here, though. Not it, rather than it being more of a question of whether or not I would step up and sign them. Of course, I'd step up and sign them. If I, if I, if it was something that I was opposed to for legal reasons or ethical reasons or anything else, uh, the the one thing that I would not do is try and hold the party hostage. I would not try and hold my seat and say, I will sit here during this convention and I will pretend to be the secretary, but when it's all said and done, I'll refuse to sign the documents. That is the most absurd thing I have ever heard. It's the most selfish statement I've ever heard anybody make. It's completely disqualifying. And when somebody is willing to make that statement to say, you know what? Um, I am the elected secretary and I refuse to do something and you cannot get somebody else to replace me because I'm the elected secretary. And so it's not going to get done and the party's going to suffer. If somebody is willing to make that public statement, they should resign. They should be removed. They are no longer qualified to hold that position. And so this is not about who would step up and fill that because any number of people could and would step up and fill that function without question. The point now is that we're at a point where we can no longer take her at her word. Her word is no good. She has said she will do this, and it's a huge threat to us. It's a huge threat to the party. If she waits for ratification, ratification never happens because the uh, Orlando Convention is a pipe dream anyway, then where are we at? This is too big of a risk. It's too big of a threat. I think that somebody needs to replace her. The motion needs to be made and the delegates need to replace her before the convention, the convention at the start of the convention when it's gaveled in on Friday. I think that, that I think that there's way too much risk there and I don't think we can take her at her word after what she said, which again, I think is a completely disqualifying statement. Thank you so much, Mr. Allison, uh, for that response. And uh, to close out the direct questions, it would be uh, your opportunity to ask Mr. McMahon uh, your final question. All right. So um, I know that you are a movie producer, director, like your uh, movies is your, is your thing, right? And uh, I know your, I think your current project you're working on is called Oh My Darling. Is that right? That is that is correct. Can you tell us a little bit about Oh My Darling, uh, what the you know the premise behind it, and when we can expect to see it? Oh wow, well, that's great. I, I'm glad that um, we didn't plan that at all. That's awesome. Um, so Oh My Darling is uh, going to be a feature length uh, slasher uh, film in the in the vein of like Halloween um, or you know with Michael Myers, um, and it it centers around um, somebody if you've ever oh my darling uh clementine if you know that song from huckleberry or huckleberry hound what have you um the killer uh or stalker in in this film uh actually hums that and sings it as he's stalking his prey uh so that's why it's called oh my darling um we were supposed to begin uh actual uh hardcore production um next month it is now on pause uh, and we don't anticipate starting production back up until June of 2021, unfortunately, oh. because we have sets that are only available to us during summer periods. Um, and it's just too much of a risk for, for us to ask our actors who have fight scenes and some sex scenes um, to be that close to each other at this time. Um, so we've, we're, we're delaying until next year. Uh, but when it comes out, uh, you'll know it'll be a big thing. It is a, a full feature. Um, probably won't be in movie theaters, but um, uh, you'll definitely be able to get the Blu-ray from me. And you should visit the Facebook page, Oh My Darling, uh, and join to get more information. All right, that worked out pretty well, actually. Um, I'm glad I ran back into my living room before we started to grab the thin blue line. <laughs> Because uh, I would have been so embarrassed had you asked me that and I hadn't grabbed that card game to do that. Oh. So, so I, I, this would be sort of an extra question, but I guess a little legitimate one. And that's something you had already. It wasn't something you, you got as a prop for the, for the debate. That was something you already had in your, your living room. Oh, the thin blue line. Oh, no, actually, like, seriously. Um, I mean, I've had this for it's been about a, a year or so, I think. Uh, and my... I actually do pull this out and play it with uh, some of my, my, my more statist friends. Um, um, I have a friend who is a cop and he claims to be a libertarian 
And my favorite thing in the world is to make him play this when he's had a couple of margaritas um, because I'm testing you. Are you a libertarian or are you a cop? Which one are you going to be? How mad are you going to get at me? Um, but so, yeah, I, I actually, I do. I love pulling it out. And uh, we do game nights with our friends regularly. And every now and then um, I, I, I pull that out and we play it because it, it is fun. Uh, I think it needs to be bigger. I think there there needs to be more cards. Uh, there needs to be like expansion packs or what have you. Um, but it is. It's it's a lot of fun and it exposes the idea of um, the police state. Um, and um, so well, that's that, yeah. That's great. Yeah. I, I I appreciate that candid response. And uh, Mr. Allison, if uh, please uh, throw a link up to the game in in the the comments of the video and, and share it along, and I'll try to find one to share as well. Um, so, but then coming to the, the close of our debate tonight, uh, gentlemen, thank you again so much for, for agreeing to participate tonight and uh, share your views with the delegates uh, before the online sitting. Uh, Mr. Ellison, you open tonight's debate with uh, the first opening statement, so you'll uh, offer the first closing statement tonight. You have two minutes, and uh, Mr. McMahon, you, you may not rebut to this, but you could certainly include something in your, your final statement. Uh, if you could do it on the fly. So, uh, Mr. Ellison, the floor is yours. So I've built my reputation in this party as a candidate and a candidate on federal level. And I think that as a candidate on the federal level, I think the goal is to get as much attention and media publicity and, and um, as possible. And so the way I've done that is through uh, audacious messaging. I'm a member of the Audacious Caucus. And I think as a candidate, I think that's really important. But I think it's important to distinguish that role as a candidate from what the role is of an LNC member. Again, I have a day job. I'm very, uh, I'm very uh, successful in my career in construction management and operations management. And so I know how to separate when it's time to be bold and brash and audacious versus when it's time to conduct business. And on the LNC, it's time to conduct business. We've got enough people that are disruptive on the LNC right now, and 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 none of them would be people would consider me to be disruptive. You see me on that board; it's it would be strictly business. That is that is where we conduct the business of this party. There is uh, three, and maybe more candidates in the race. There's three candidates in this race. Two candidates in this race are incredibly qualified and would be great secretaries. And then there's one that we currently have in office right now. And so I think that you really need to think about again the goal of the individual that you're electing to fill this position? And, and are they running for this position for personal gain or are they running for this position for the betterment of the party? I'm certainly running for the better for betterment of the party. I do most of the stuff I do to my own, you know, it hurts me, I pay the consequences, but I'm willing to make that sacrifice and do things for the betterment of the party. And that's what this is about for me. And so I would appreciate, again, appreciate your support. Uh, the delegates are going to make the choice. I know the delegates will make the right choice. I just hope that's me. Thank you so much, Mr. Allison. Mr. McMahon, uh, the same to you. Two minutes for a uh, closing statement tonight. So as we, we talked about earlier, um, I've been involved in the party for 10 years. I've been a party member. Uh, I've worked with candidates in every state uh, except uh, Alaska and Hawaii. I've worked with state chairs. I've helped develop county parties. Um, I've been there whenever the party needed me to answer the call, whether it was to pick up and move to Illinois for a month for ballot access uh, uh, protection or to move to go out to Colorado, to Colorado Springs, to spend a month out there helping a candidate get on the ballot in the recall election, uh, spending two weeks in Dallas Fort Worth uh, to help uh, train uh, county chairs on how to support their candidates and, and hold business meetings. Um, 10 years. Uh, of doing that. And I've got 10 years more in me, I think, at least. Um, I'm dedicated to the party and I want to make sure that we're, we're operating as best we can. And the way we do that is by having a professional LNC that is willing to work together. Even when we disagree, we have to have respect for each other. Uh, the way I operate is, you know, let's have a debate, let's have an honest discussion, and then let's have an up or down vote. We can't go back and forth bickering and fighting. We have to actually get the job done. And sometimes that means I lose. Sometimes that means the other person loses. But we have to be respectful and we have to keep moving forward. We can't have a divided, div divisive LNC where everything is a fight and everything is a vendetta. It's just stagnating the party and people are leaving in droves. 
I don't want to see our party fail because of that. I want to see Indiana and uh, other states become uh, solid gold states. So with that, I would appreciate your vote and your support. And my door is always open. You can contact me on Facebook or give me a call. Thank you, gentlemen, so much, both of you, for participating tonight. And I wish you both the best of luck in your campaigns. Uh, and uh, very much appreciate both the, the professionalism and the respect you uh, presented to each other and myself throughout the whole negotiations and, and uh, carry follow through with the debate tonight. Uh, to the delegates who might be showing up, uh, both virtually or in Orlando, Mr. Ellison, is there somewhere where they could find out more information about your campaign? Uh, yeah, just find me on Facebook. Uh, Brian Ellison for LNC Secretary, I think is the page. Uh, check that out. Uh, or just find me on Facebook. It's easier to uh, uh, be happy to accept your friend request. Ha hit me up in Messenger. Um, I'd be happy to talk to anybody who has any questions. Mr. McMahon, how might they be able to find more information about your campaign? Uh, the easiest way is going to be on Facebook. You can either go to my personal profile or I have a political page, uh, Evan McMahon uh, LP. Uh, I've had that for a while. Um, and uh, I don't always accept friend requests. I'm a little guarded on friend requests. But if you send me a message, I will see the message request and I will respond. There are a lot of people who have been surprised how often I respond to uh, random message requests. Um, I'll always answer an email or a text message or a phone call. I uh, believe in communication and, and talking to people. And as a matter of fact, I prefer a phone call uh, as opposed to a text. I guess I'm not quite a millennial. No worries. Thank you guys both so much for participating tonight. And uh, best of luck uh, to both of you in your campaigns and to your pursuits of uh, liberty in our lifetimes. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Appreciate you putting this together. Thank you, sir. It's been, it's been a great pleasure. And I must say that uh, Mr. Ellison, um, you know, there may be a caricature of you online uh, that people know, but I would encourage them to get to know the real you and to see that you actually are a genuinely good guy, a gentleman, and somebody who is very, can be very professional. And so I appreciate you, sir. Can be. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen, very much. And uh, thank you to everyone who has watched. Have a great evening.